thanks everyone for waiting. We'll 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 get underway. Um, it's my pleasure on behalf of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Plant Success in Nature and Agriculture to welcome um, John Passeur as our speaker today. And first of all, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the many lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly uh, honoured to, um, to welcome John and introduce him today. He's, he's, he's been a bit of a hero of mine for a long, long time. Um, so I'm a chief investigator in the Centre of Excellence and um, John has had a long and distinguished career in CSIRO as a leader of the Crop Adaptation Program and many of you are probably aware of that. And he now holds an emeritus appointment at ANU. His research has been very influential on improving water limited productivity of dryland crops globally. I have personally used plant water uptake functions based on work he did many years ago in crop models in APSIM, and we still use them, and they work remarkably well. I'm sure his topic today will be of interest to all of you, and over to you, John, and we uh, look forward to your presentation. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about now is the view that uh, there is a conflict between um, basic science and application. And Donald Stokes, uh, who uh, wrote a book called Pasteur's Quadrant, uh, disagreed strongly with that, and uh, I have become a disciple because... Um, Starting with Pasteur, his dictum is chance favors the prepared mind, and for him, chance can be either basic science or curing a, a person of a disease. Niels Bohr uh, spent a long time learning how to uh, find the structure of uh, atoms, and you might think, well, that's on its own, but it isn't on its own because as soon as he's found out, he's gone on to larger things. Edison doesn't seem to know what he's doing, from what I can make out, but his offsiders are able to turn on his lights. And Rob Williamson, who uh, works at ANU in computing, um, put the southwest corner in, which Stokes left out, because he's interested in birds and they don't seem to have either a consideration of use or a consideration of understanding. So <clears throat> moving on, I'd like to uh, start with the general structures and functions and organizations of crop plants to give us some general feeling about what's going on. And the levels of organization that I think almost all of us are used to thinking about, at least knowing that they're there, because each level has its specific features, its processes, its terminology, and most levels are defined by a physical boundary. Uh, and... Uh, that physical boundary is very important because um, it controls what is happening uh, on one side compared with the other. So in looking at the interactions between the levels of organization, uh, I've taken here a phenomenon of interest on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, I have a phenomenal interest, phenomenon of interest called a cell. So uh, if you've got a cell physiologist who is fascinated by organelles, 
um, then uh, you might think of that as um, basic science, as indeed it, it is in a sense. But what is its biological significance? Can you go from understanding about organelles to tissue, organ, plant, and uh, I'm not a cell physiologist, but I don't know um, how a cell communicates with tissues, organs, and plants, other than perhaps talking to each to each other. So uh, the next slide gives me um, the closing of a generational loop, which takes the range of levels and turns them in upon itself so that uh, you can see with a little imagination that you're looking at a helix that is coming towards you as each generation comes and goes. So um, back to the cell, I and many of, of the people around you now might well know how to do this, but I don't see how a cell can go from cell, which, by the way, is the middle of the different levels of organization, and trot across like the gene does to the plant, trot across to the plant. No doubt it, it will have some eventual effect on tissue, organ, and plant, um, but uh, that is, um, you're not quite sure where that's going, at least I'm not. Now, um, it was when, but 1969, uh, Arthur Kirstler decided to bring together about 15 very eminent people in Austria to talk about a book that he wanted their papers to go in called um, Beyond Reductionism. And uh, Paul Weiss uh, was the first, uh, had the first chapter in that book. And there were a fellow called Ludwig von Bertalanffy uh, created general systems theory, and uh, that was in about the 1930s. But it's and it's I think still going well. But what is the system? Uh, I think Weiss puts it well. In a system, the structure of the whole determines the operation of the parts. But he also thinks about a machine, does Paul Weiss. And in a machine, the operation of the parts determines the outcome. So you can tell, says Weiss, that the basic characteristic of a system is its essential invariance beyond the much more variant flux and fluctuations of its elements or constituents. So there's stuff whizzing around all over the place, and one can perhaps think of a balloon where there are molecules whizzing around all over the place, but it's something that you don't need to know about. So, I want to talk briefly about the information content of a hierarchical system. As moving clock, <clears throat> moving anti-clockwise around the figure meets with additional information to that in the lower levels. Okay, so it meets with additional information to, to those in the lower levels that is behind them. For example, a leaf has an epidermis, it's punctured by a stomata that can control gas exchange. It contains tissues with different functions. And yet, 
we can explore some behaviors of belief without needing to think about its mesophil or its xylem. So if your phenomenon of interest is your leaf, you can think about uh, the mechanistic understanding of its contents, and you can also think about its biological significance. So this is the first, and this is the second appearance of translational research. And um, it isn't something that you keep going forward towards your crop because you can go backwards with it. And uh, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a backwards example. And that uh, was the discovery from Steve Simfendorfer and John Kierkegaard that uh, direct drill crops grew their leaves rather more slowly than the um, other crops. And so you've got sluggish leaves as the phenomenon of interest. You've got mechanistic understanding, which uh, you bet is roots. And the biological significance is that you, you're lagging. So was it that the soil was too hard below the seed? And one might say somewhat, as you can see from the um, picture on the right. But what it really was, was inhibitory bacteria. And uh, these uh, would paint themselves on the roots and uh, give them a little poison, which stopped them from going. And uh, Steve and John uh, sterilized the soil that they collected from the field. And you can see the difference there from then on. And uh, while that might look as though it's not going to last because it's sterilized, the um, painting of the bacteria onto the roots uh, was uh, fairly slow. And if you put a tine below where you put the seed, the root would whiz through that and that would leave the bacteria behind. And so they were away. They'd solved that problem. Now, uh, uh, Paul Weiss's talk about machines uh, is an interesting one. And the shortcut can work beautifully if the plant is not affected by metabolic interactions. So this is what happens with the shortcut in action. We've got pest resistance, it's on its own. We've got herbicide resistance of the crop, which is on its own. The grain quality, the omega-3 fatty acids that uh, Surinda Singh um, made in canola with um, nine new genes which gives you end product metabolism. So it's not kicking around at all. Disease resistance is the only one I could find on um, uh, papaya. And uh, a slightly rough one with aluminum tolerance on uh, uh, tips of roots, which um, has uh, malate involved and little metabolic interference. So they uh, aren't having um, any effect, all of those things, on what is going on in the rest of the plant. So 
um, this couldn't resist saying semi finally the complete growing season of a crop sowing to harvest is something any agronomist should consider um short term lab lab experiments that i have seen some of have transient effects on plant growth and they may not last but um a lot of lab experiments and i'm taking a bit of a sideways track now is that pot experiments that are watered to drip point can readily saturate the bottoms of pots and if the soil is fine you might find that the plants you're growing in a say 20 centimeter high pot will um, be saturated for the uh, 10 centimeters below all of that and it's something that has uh, irritated me for a long time and i wrote a paper called perils of pot experiments some 20 years ago but uh, i just would beg people who do those sorts of experiments without the understanding of gravity influencing on them i would hope that you can escape now um we're in the field so the starting point is the field for the successful translation research on the whole and um what i did forget to mention uh, after you spoke graham was that um that i live uh, 1200 kilometers south of brisbane and that i will not be um, doing the work that you do with uh, <clears throat> with uh, tropical and subtropical uh, plants etc so i am telling you that i'm going now to south to southern australia because that's what i know about so uh, there was little control of drought before 1970. But uh, Henry Nix, whom those of you with grey hair or bald scalps might um, remember, uh, found a strong correlation between wheat yield in Bilawila, if you please, which I'm back into Queensland, and available soil water in the three weeks before anthesis. So that is uh, Pasteur's eye opener. That creates an opportunity. And the opportunity was to save water during the vegetative phase of a crop to provide more for grain set and grain filling. So I'm going to go through a series of decades now. In the 70s, um, there were considerable discussions in the wake of uh, Henry's interest that led to a deeper understanding of the seasonal water use by wheat. wheat. Donald and Hamblin um, really brought harvest index to light in the in the 70s and um i chanced upon a useful identity um also in the 70s and identities are tricky because uh, you can just cancel out the right side and you find yield equals yield but uh, nevertheless the three bits are independent of each other so optimal flowering times essential and which is late September in Southern Australia, retaining 
about 30% of available water at this time is, is important. It gives you the best harvest index you can get. Then in the 80s, the overthrow of the view that Australian wheat yield was largely limited by water was just totally overthrown, quite startlingly, startlingly. And it was overthrown by Jeff, by Reg French and Jeff Schultz, who um, 40 years ago um, looked at a graph of yields against rainfall. And I suspect that in 40 years ago, any uh, average agronomist would try and draw a, a regression line through those. But Reg and Jeff were too smart for that, and they found a, a straight line boundary. Now, uh, there were many impediments uh, that dealt with or that, that generated that uh, huge, um, massive uh, dots there. That then, even more surprisingly, um, Peter Cornish and colleague uh, had a look at the yields of wheat in Wagga Wagga Shire over 33 years between 1950 and 1983. And there is this astonishing um, parallel bunch of uh, dots parallel to the x-axis. Uh, the horizontal cluster uh, arose from risk management because um, what was happening was that the uh, that there were root diseases in the Shire and uh, the uh, roots would uh, <clears throat> not be able to deal with the diseases. And if you tried to uh, add nitrogen to the plants you were trying to grow, uh, you would find quite often that they would just fall over. Oh, the farmers were shocked into action by the, those graphs. The upper bounding line was 20 kilograms per hectare millimetre. But uh, that at that time was uh, in pretty perfect conditions. And the general attain attainable benchmark was accepted fairly widely as 15 kilograms per hectare millimetre rather than 20. And you know, subsequently it went up to 22, 25 and so on. And the three three ton club in Western Australia changed its aim to fifteen kilograms per hectare millimeter, which is more accurate. And uh, during the nineties, um, the average wheat yield rose by about thirty thirty percent, and the changed practices that brought that about were the introduction of canola which was a break crop that um, enabled wheat to grow much better after it. Um, direct drilling, the, the general direct drilling area in the 90s increased from about 10% to 70 to 80%. Uh, there was control of root diseases because uh, Cornish's graph um, made everyone think about them. And um, once the root diseases were gone, there was a healthy response to N and you could get up to six or seven tons per hectare in Wagga Wagga Shire. Then during the millennium drought, um, a lot of interesting things were happening. So the autumn rains uh, were halved or more. The summer rains 
remained as they usually did, and they came in storms, which meant that the rains um, sunk into the soil rather further than they would if they weren't storms. Farmers began to conserve the summer rains by strict weed control because they had a choice between waiting until late June to sow their crop, which is going to be pretty dreadful, or to sow early and dry. And would the sowing dry be worthwhile? Well, it was. And um, the breeders took interest in that in both phenology and long coleoptiles because the optimal flowering time in late September uh, was going to be this should be the same whether it was in the seeds were sown in in June or in say April or earlier and long coleoptiles came into considerable interest. Well, at that time, uh, uh, um, GRDC asked me to go and talk to uh, three or four groups of farmers in New South Wales who were deeply concerned that if they so dry, and if there was five millimetres of rain, then and then there was no more rain, then they were terrified that their wheat would germinate, it would imbibe water, uh, it would start to shrink, and it would die. So... Oh, um, I went back to um, a few decades before all that to try and find out what people thought about uh, the behaviour of wheat plants, and they surely are tough. So um, from the discussion I had with those farmers, um, I, I wrote a, a piece for Farming Ahead, in 2006, I was in the field in 2005, the headline being false starts, no sweat for dry sown crops. So what the wheat plant, what the wheat seed does is that it uh, imbibes the water and then it stops imbibing and there is a flat period of about equal time in which it activates uh, the proteins and enzymes in it. And once it's activated them, uh, you get a ramp going upwards again and the plants away. But interestingly, uh, seeds will germinate in um, 1.5 megapascal of soil water potential, which, which is uh, somewhat amazing. But it does so only at about half the rate of seeds in moist soil. And uh, it usually um, stuns me when I see 99% relative humidity, but 99% 90 relative humidity is uh, 1.3 megapascals. In the soil. So there was much interest in long coleoptiles. They enabled the seeds to be sown deeply enough to reach 1.5 megapascals, soil water potential, and to make slow progress into increasingly wetter soils so that they, um, there was hardly any loss of um, of uh, wheat crops during most of the time unless it was a horrendous uh, 
drought. Uh, translate. Translational research in the search for drought resistance or tolerance was an absolutely dismal failure. And what we're looking at now is a chart from the web of science in which um, the topic was drought resistance or drought tolerance and transgenic or molecular and wheat or barley or maize or rice or canola. The number of papers so far uh, was 2,400. The citations were 50,000. And the number of successes was essentially one. It, there was a group of Argentinians who uh, played with uh, a transcription factor that you see there, HAHB4, that comes from sunflower. And the reason that they were successful was that it took them 20 years after the initial experiments to get the plants working in the field and they were at at the moment they're getting about uh 20 percent extra yield during a say uh, a two decile um rain oh um i, I hope mark cooper's in the audience but i i i I, I maybe Mark has got ten of these successes, which I've been unaware of. But uh, we happen to know about the uh, Argentinians, and in fact, uh, we went there to uh, have a look at what they were doing about ten years ago. Oh, somewhat sociological departure, which is still, I think, the linear language of agricultural R&D, extension, technology transfer, etc. Um, and that implies that th those one-way traffic, that implies no discussions between farmers and agronomists, and I'll come back to that later. So, um, This is, I've been using this graph for you know, 10, or, 10 or more years now, but it, it is, uh, I think, the easiest way of making sure that translational research would be going well. Um, I've got the, um, the yellow-green uh, words above and below the horizontal farmers and agronomists and breeders and uh, didn't have the space for the physiologists and molecular biologists, but they were, many of them, uh, in the part, in the party. Um, now, uh, I've been talking about Southern Australia and uh, over the last, um, you know, in, in the previous decade from now, um, the uh, farmers, uh, well, the agronomists and farmers used the name dual purpose crops to show what uh, grazing will do in uh, with wheat and with canola and uh, there's been quite an uptake of that and uh, and you see that they're doing particularly well so uh, 
a interesting story from must be four or five years ago now was that a um a canola grower um, uh, somewhere in the um, tablelands not the tablelands but it um in a nice rolling part of the country sowed his canola crop he uh when it had grown adequately to be able to um, keep going and and fix itself in the soil and he um he had the sheep in he took the sheep out he harvested the canola and he broke the record for yield of canola that was held by the uk by 100 kilograms per hectare because he got 7.2 and they had 7.1 which is just extraordinary on the um on the wheat side um, <clears throat> uh, I was at a, a, <clears throat> a farmer's day uh, you know, quite a while ago now in which uh, I was just starting to look at uh, grazing with sheep and um, John Kierkegaard was running that day and he explained very clearly and carefully that as soon as um, the meristem started coming up that it was time to take the sheep off and half a dozen uh, fellows at the back in their 50s i would have guessed said no we're not going to do that And John got quite bewildered and they said, listen, the, co the price of fat lambs is enormous. We're going to make money from them and lose a bit on the wheat, which just goes to show what happens when an agronomist talks to a farmer. So um, <clears throat> this is a presence from from John Kierkegaard, and uh, the the canola the um, uh, plants changing over uh, ro rotation. Um, this, this is one of John's experiments. Uh, so canola is the main break crop. The legumes are good in some area. And um, chickpea in the north, I suppose, does that mean Queensland or northern New South Wales? And lentils in York Peninsula, which can be tremendously prolific when the time comes. But there are no legumes that are broadly adapted and not profitable in the year grown, although um, barber beans uh, three or four years ago became so vigorous that you could you couldn't walk into the crop and an interesting point is that if you have a double break as john remarks which is legume and canola then uh, and give a an nitrogen boost to the canola you've got two years of broadleaf control that smothers the weeds in the wheat So, goodness, 45 minutes down. Um, 
the finale in in this is southern australia um I think the agronomists are looking at better rotations, controlling summer weeds, no-till, so in April, and a new variety uh, of um, wheat with long cold aptiles, which are now uh, approved, and there will be new varieties coming around. And um, I come back again to the most important to me of the discussions between agronomists and farmers enthusiastic, enthusiastically uh, extremely important. And uh, GIDC um, some oh, ten, 10 years ago uh, gave Southern Australian agronomist, seventeen million dollars to look after sixteen groups of farmers and agronomists over five years, and they challenged them to get a ten percent increase in yield. Well, the increase in yield was substantially more than ten percent. And uh, they had uh, extremely high returns on the money spent. And what's particularly interesting about that is that the 16 groups were a mix of farmers and agronomists and the discussion between the farmers and the agronomists was such that by the time the five years were over, um, they were not sniping at each other anymore because they had already uh, made sufficient discussion that they came together. And that's it from me. And... Um, I shall be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, John. That's fantastic. So, John, while people are asking their questions, yep. thinking of questions, mm -hmm. um, I've I've got one. You mentioned in your abstract about publication and and um, the sort of need for um, you know, or the difficulty in 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 having publications not reviewed by yes. more practical uh, disciplines in the, from molecular world. We, we, we seem to strike this a lot, and it's, it's very hard to challenge a lot of these publications. So would and you like to comment on yes, that? I, I would like to comment very much, and I uh, thought that I'd run out of time, otherwise I would have added that just now. Um, there was a, a paper by a fellow called Neff, N -E -F -F, uh, three or four years ago with the title of How Academic uh, Science Has Sold Its Soul to the Publishing Industry. And the publishing industry has got uh, uh, created heaps of high impact factor journals, all of which, well, that's a bit exaggerated, perhaps most of which have only one level of um, research that they're doing, uh, level in the sense of the earlier slide that I showed you. So, um they are reviewing each other and they remain in high impact factor journals but none of them uh, have got any connection with anybody who knows how to make 
something useful. So, um, 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 yeah, we 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 have a question which sort of follows on from from that discussion a bit though, and it comes back to your picture of the the one way street versus the feedback loops. And can you expand on your thoughts about the problem of linear language to agriculture and R and D? What do you mean? Linear language. Ah, here. If we go go back to the days when there were extension officers, the extension officers told the farmers what to do, or they came up with new technology and so on. And uh, although I think that's fairly well gone away now, but the I'm just thinking of the 80, 80 20 uh, issue of um, the, the 20 percent of farmers get 80 percent of the uh, the crops, um, but the extent the Less important farmers uh, just keep you know, hanging on. So it, it was pretty much a waste of a slide, really, though. You, you <laughs> have, yeah. Ian Wright, do you, thanks, John. Do you have any positive or even inspirational messages for early career researchers? Ah. Well, um, if you're working in a lab, let me go yet again at the difficulties of doing pot experiments that do not generate artifacts. So uh, there, there are ways around it. Um, but the you can mimic uh, the outside world um, in a glasshouse environment, providing that you um, your pots are a meter tall, for example. And if you're going to grow them through a whole year, and that was something that I did in the seventies, and it, and fortunately it worked then. Um, but especially if you use um, field soil, uh, you'd be in a in a mess with a twenty centimeter high pot. It'd be the plants would be um, drowning. One from an early career researcher who happens to be one of our PhD students, Ben Darrington. What recommendation? Would you have regarding how to manage undertaking this kind of translational research in a more academic setting, especially when it seems like the metrics for success in both areas may not be quite in agreement? Now, um, how do you distinguish between translational research and academic? And you, you can be a hell of a good translational researcher and an academic unless you're um, burying yourself in in a small piece of what might be useful. It's, I think, probably the pressures for um, the high-impact factor journal article ah. or whatever, yes, that you've been right. yeah. discussing. Well, um, Graham, I'll, I'm going to send you for circulation uh, mark neff's paper that would be good so mm -hmm. perhaps just just to finish john one from um tim broadrib that i'll just sort of bring it back to a to a broader scale mm -hmm. do you feel like the balance between pure science and agricultural science funding is wrong in australia or the world well no i don't think it's it's wrong I, you've you've got uh people worrying about uh, looking into um, various parts of plants that uh, sometimes throw up interesting things to do. But um, 
I think uh, I'm not sure, but I think that they might be about equal. Uh, I, well, there's a lot of, uh, of course, of course, there's a lot of agricultural sciences scientists around, and a lot of academics around who are interested in um, delving into plants, see how they behave. That's good. I think perhaps if we could just um, loop them together as you did in your your feedback diagram, I think that's probably what we're trying to do in the Centre of Excellence. And uh, it's probably a good place to stop, John. We've gone a little bit over time, but I'm okay. sure right. nobody nobody's going to uh, be moaned about that. And and so look, thanks thanks very much for your presentation. That was an interesting talk and an interesting discussion. Um, and there is, a, there is a recording of the event that will be available on the Plant Success YouTube channel soon. Mm -hmm. So people will be able to um, go back and watch, watch bits of it. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you all uh, for attending. And, and John, if you would send us that, that yep. link or that paper, or even if you email it to me, that'd be fine. I'll, yep. I'll get it distributed. Okay. Thank you all very much. Right, wonderful, and uh, nice talking to you all.